Hello and welcome to Anxiety Hacks. I'm your host, Kate Hudson Hall, and thank you everybody so much for listening. I'm an anxiety therapist and also an author. Now, my new book is out called Anxiety Hacks. And within the book, there is many different techniques that you can learn to help you to begin to break those difficult behaviors. There's a, so it's it's jam-packed full of lots of different tools and tips and techniques to help you to begin to learn about you and your anxiety and how you can you know, begin to start to address it and what you can do. <clears throat> So if you want to check it out, it is on Amazon. So you'll be able to find it there. So um, our guest now, our fabulous guest today. Oh, let me tell you. Our guest is Shannon Bryant. Now, Shannon is an ACA survivor, an adult child of an alcoholic and understands the behavioral challenges from growing up in a chaotic environment. After experiencing decades of jealousy in her own relationships, she decided enough was enough and set out to stop being drawn into bad relationships and ruining the good ones. Through much research and soul searching, Shannon has tamed her jealousy and is now a certified life coach and a host of the Jealousy Junkie podcast, helping others re relieve their own relationship with fears and anxiety. So Shannon, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. So should we dive in? And maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what life was like growing up with an alcoholic parent and your anxiety and must have been on overload, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, the anxiety was every day. It was constant anxiety. When you grow up in that type of environment, you're never sure what's going to happen day to day. Um, and going to school and trying to learn multiplication and division when you have so much anxiety at home and carrying that anxiety to school is makes it a very hard learning environment. And so a lot of people that come from that type of chaotic environment, they then carry that anxiety into their adulthood um, because that's just what they're used to. And it's yeah. interesting, you know, in the bio, you talk about the relationships and, and um, my failed relationships, a lot of that stemmed from that anxiety, always worrying about either this is going to go away um, like my dad, or I'm going to lose this person. And that's really when the jealousy sets in and that anxiety just keeps going. You keep carrying it, waiting for the other shoe to fall. Yeah. And how did you deal with your anxiety? You know, once you um, began, began to be aware of that pattern, what did you do to begin to change it? There are a couple of things. Of course, I, um, I went to therapy, tried therapy, um, and it's kind of funny. I got actually got kicked out of therapy. If that's the real, I got asked. I got <laughs> invited. Got not, <laughs> I was invited to not come back, and I think <laughs> because I went into it thinking. I just need to feel better. I want to stop feeling the way that I do. And I want to stop having all these racing thoughts and knots in my stomach all the time. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah. But I wasn't really putting in that work. I just wanted somebody to say, yeah. do this, do that. And not yeah. looking at what was really causing that anxiety to come up because forever I felt like my, my dad left when I was, 12. And I didn't speak to him again until I was 25. And I thought it didn't affect me. I didn't realize how much that affected me in my adulthood growing up that way, yeah. because I thought, you know, he hasn't been here for all the big milestones in my life. I don't need him. It doesn't affect me. 
And so I don't need to go back and do any of that me work as we call it. So just tell me what to do to feel better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then what sort of, what was the turning point for you to actually realize, Ooh, I, I, I think there are things to address here. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I found what is called the laundry list. Um, my, the last therapist I went to as I was leaving, the one that I was invited not to come back, the great thing that happened was she handed me the laundry list, which is, you know, like these 15 behavioral characteristics of a child who grew up in an alcoholic family. When you go through and I was like, okay, check, 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 check. Okay. I have pretty much all of these. And that was really a turning point for me to go, okay, wait a second. If there's a list, that means there are solutions for this. There, there, there are the, what I'm experiencing, someone else has experienced, and there are ways to overcome that. So that was really the start of my journey. Right. Yeah. 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 I bet that and was then, a real revelation to think, gosh, you know, other people have moved on. That means that I can move on. Right. Yes. Because forever I just thought, that's the way that I'm wired. I'm wired this way. I'm always going to just be an anxious person. I'm always going to have jealousy in my relationship. I'm always going to be fearful and waiting for the other shoe to fall. So to see it on paper and to see, oh, there are people who are overcoming this and I need to figure out how they're doing it. And so I really started to do a lot of research and going back to go, okay, what are some of the the exercises or tools that I was provided that I just didn't do before and started to do those? And what were they? There's one really great one that I love. It was extremely eye-opening for me. And I don't know if this is the proper name for it, but the lifeline exercise. So it's really simple to do. But you just take a piece of paper, turn it horizontal, draw a line in the center, write high on the top left, low on the bottom left, and then starting from your first memory, writing down and kind of putting a hash mark of all of those experiences, things that happened in your life that were um, memorable or that made an impression or that you felt stood out to you. and it's such an eye-opening experience to go when you start connecting the dots and going, this was at a really high. And then here were all these things that happened. Well, of course I would feel that way. Or of course that makes sense that then I would carry that into my adulthood. Yeah. So it's, a, it, that's just one exercise. So then you, you could see the pattern of the same yes. behavior mm -hmm. in your adulthood. Mm-hmm. Yes. And what's really interesting about it, because one of the things that I noticed was every time something good would happen, there would be something kind of a fallout to that. And that was what I carried of thinking, well, I don't want to get too excited about this. I don't, I can't be happy because I know something is around the corner looming for me. So it really forced me to go back and go, is that true? Or I'm just remembering, you know, those things that are standing out to me. So what mm. else is true? Are there other things that happened during that time that weren't negative? And of course there were, it's just what's standing out in your mind. And so I had to go back and go, there were so many great things that were happening. Yes, this one negative thing happened, but there were so many other amazing things that also happened. Mm. Mm. And so I suppose, you know, the anxiety was interwoven throughout your life, really. Yes. And the interesting part, I think, where it really affects relationships, whether it's a romantic relationship, relationship with friends, family, is it almost becomes uncomfortable without the anxiety, without the chaos. Because Absolutely. So it's kind of scary to... without it for some people because they don't yes, know how it's... to live their lives. Yeah. Yes. Because you are always in kind of that fight or flight mode and protection mode when you are anxious and in that environment that that's what you're comfortable with. And that's what you think life 
is like and should be. So when I say I I ruined many good relationships, a lot of times it was because, well, this feels weird and unnatural and boring and yeah. uncomfortable because there's no chaos. Yeah. Very interesting. Interesting. So, um, so now you're a life coach. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so, well, what other ways helped you with your anxiety back then? Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that really stands out to me, we, we do a lot of, um, bringing in information outside of data. So a lot of the anxiety we tend to cause ourselves where instead of just looking at the data, we start needing to connect dots and, okay, this one thing happened. Well, what does that mean? And so we start to fill in that information, whether it be my, my partner turned their phone face down. What does that mean? And starting to go into all of these possibilities that it could be, that's really where the anxiety comes in. Typically, if we just focused on the data and what we know and ask questions based on trying to gather data, the information is where we get caught up in, the created information. And so really taking the time to go, hang on just a second, is this actual data that I know or am I creating stories around this? And so taking that time to really mm. differentiate the two makes a huge difference because then you also, if you need more information or you feel like you need more data, you will approach your questions differently instead of, again, trying to accuse someone of something or creating an unhealthy situation. If you're looking for just data, you can focus on that. Mm. Mm. So how would somebody do that? How could they you know, begin to become more aware of that pattern? Well, I think the first thing is really starting with how our emotions and what feelings we're having. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him. There's a fantastic neuroscientist called Dr. Huberman. He has mm. his own podcast, Huberman Lab. He talks about how... Um, you know, our feelings and emotions are temporary. Those will die down. Mm, but like waves. Your, mm. Yes. But your behaviors and your actions, those will outlast you. And when you look at it in terms of, okay, I need to take a second and think through this because we know that if you could get an email from someone that you thought, what, what do they mean by that? Or someone may say something to you, make a comment and your initial reaction is you're upset or you're angry or it makes you sad. We know that in a day, three days, three weeks, a year, those emotions aren't as strong as they are in the moment. So if you can remind yourself that this emotion is not going to feel this same way, in the future. Mm. So how do I yeah. want my behaviors then to be represented? So I think certainly taking that time to remind yourself of that and then tailor your behavior, your actions, your question, whatever that is, to understanding that even if it's something that you should be upset about or that that is, you know, founded we know that we're still not going to feel that same way over time, but our behaviors, those are going to stick around. There are consequences to those. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. So it's recognizing, recognizing that those thoughts and feelings will, <clears throat> will come and go mm -hmm. and they will reduce down and change. Yeah. Um, and then recognizing, you know, the behavior and starting to look from the outside in and begin to change the behavior. Yeah. Yeah. It's really coming from a sort of a 360 view when you're trying to make those changes and really trying to do some um, self-development. 
because we're so in the weeds or, you know, in the trees that we can't see that forest. And we've heard that, that same, but it does when you can kind of step back and go, I'm going to look at this situation sort of from a 360 approach. What's the data? What information do I have? I know that I'm really upset right now. That feeling's not going to last. So what other data do I need and how do I want to respond? Yes. Yeah. And have you got an example for us? Oh, goodness. Um, let me think of, well, one, you know, um, going back to someone who's unfounded, has unfounded jealousy in their relationship. There may be a situation where um, their partner, they see a, an email from a coworker and instantly you're anxious because if you're an extreme jealous person, like the people that I work with alone, just having any type of communication or contact sometimes with the opposite mm -hmm. sex is going to send you into that anxiety spiral and being worried about it. And so it is, what does the email say? And we can go down even the path of, well, why'd they put that emoji? And why did they use a smiley face? And why mm -hmm. was it necessary to respond that way? So again, it's what, what does it read? What is the information? And if you feel like I need more information about this person, that's when you're really going to have to take that moment to go, I'm feeling upset about it right now. This is my anxiety. This is because, you know, maybe in someone's situation, that's the way that they grew up. This anxiety is there. Does it need to be there? And is that serving me today? Do I need to be in that protection mode right now? So taking that moment again to go, well, what's the information? Exactly what does it say? And then you can ask your follow-up questions based on trying to get more data, not with your emotions, because that yeah. usually will lead to potential <laughs> argument. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Very interesting. So um, so you work with people with anxiety, with um, jealousy, mm -hmm. and then you also have a podcast, Jealousy Junkie Podcast. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so tell us about that. Yes. So um, I mostly work with people who have unfounded jealousy, meaning nothing's really happened in their current relationship, but for some reason... They're constantly anxious and fearful in that relationship. And jealousy is always about either the past or the future. It's never about the present. So yeah. uh, meaning we are either operating because of something that happened in the past. So it could be the way that you were raised. In my case, my dad left and it felt like, well, if my own dad doesn't love me, why am I, why would I be worthy of anyone else loving me? So I was mm -hmm. always afraid that that person was going to leave me, that I was going to be abandoned. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it could be something from your past growing up in that situation, or it could be that you've had relationships with infidelity or a series of relationships with infidelity. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing that into your current relationship because you're trying to protect your future, right? We're protecting our heart, protecting what's going to happen in the future. So it's never really about the present, but we can get really wrapped up and all of our energy focused on our partner and that anxiety that we're feeling. And it's really hard if we don't have some of the tools and techniques that we talked about to get out of that anxiety loop. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I share with people that I work with is we've all heard to do breathing techniques, to slow down our nervous system, to kind of make that correction. And there you can Google a ton of different breathing techniques, but the thing that where we struggle is not practicing them outside of a dire situation. So it's just like CPR. We probably all learned or took a class at some point on how to do CPR. But if I haven't done it since seventh grade health class and you asked me in an emergency situation to do it right now, I'm going to struggle and I'm going to, it's not working. I don't know exactly how to do it. I kind of mm -hmm. know what I'm supposed to do, 
but it's not working. So I think when you're in that situation and you're feeling that anxiety, it's stepping away, doing some breathing exercises, but the important part is to practice them before you need them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's such a, you know, such a good um, metaphor for, you know, we, we don't practice them unless we need them. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, we may not do it correctly. We may not have practiced it for a good few weeks. And then we've forgotten the specific steps of how to make it most beneficial for our bodies. Yes. And are we, you know, when you're in a emergency situation or your, your nervous system, you have that anxiety going on, it's really hard to think clearly. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't, if it's not almost a habit for you, that's going to come naturally in an emergency situation, it's probably not going to work for you. And so I think where people get caught up when they're trying to work with their anxiety using breathing techniques is they're not doing it outside of that desperate situation so that their body just instantly knows this is how to do it. And I'm kind of doing it on command when I am in a, a desperate situation. Yeah, absolutely. And it becomes a, by practicing it when you're not in that difficult situation, whatever it may be, then it by practicing it when you're not in that situation, then it, it becomes a um, an everyday sort of like pattern. It's an anchor to um to to your breathing, so you can easily kind of hook into it and be able mm-hmm. to attune to it and immediately yes. gain the benefits. Yes, because jealousy suffers and people with anxiety, and that moment comes on very quickly. Yeah. So it's going to come pretty quickly, and all of those emotions are boiling up. And so, as you said, which was a great way to say it, if you can't hook into it very quickly then it's not probably going to work for you. And then that's sometimes where people give up and say, I can't get over um, feeling anxious. I can't get over feeling jealous in my relationship because nothing's working for me. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And in in my book, Anxiety Hacks, I talk specifically how to practice the the, uh, breathing where you breathe in for um four seconds and you hold it for as long as you can and then breathing out for eight and the specific reasons why you need to do it and work with your breathing like that to be able to work with your nervous system and to be able to access your parasympathetic nervous system that calm normal relaxed nervous system (laughs) yes well and think about that i mean if you tried you know, breathing out for eight seconds, actually, that feels like kind of a long time for the first few times you're doing it. So Mm -hmm. even in that example, yes, of that breathing technique, wonderful breathing technique. So you you need to kind of practice that like, oh, breathing out for eight seconds until it becomes really natural for you. Yes. Yeah. And how else would you suggest people? And what else could they do to begin to, you know, work with their anxiety and help themselves? Um, I mean, I think, you know, using the, the one thing, and we've been talking about it a little bit is that practicing, not mastering or practicing piece of it. And I talk about it all the time, but if we're going into situations, especially people with anxiety and how we have our racing thoughts and our mind is kind of all over the place. If we go into that situation thinking, well, I'm going to try this approach or I'm not going to be this way the next time, or I need to tame my anxiety. And we try a technique. We try one of the, the things that we've discussed today and it doesn't work. Then we tend to give up and we tend to think it doesn't work and that we're doomed to be that way. So going into it with the practicing, not mastering approach I'm just practicing right now. I may not be good at meditation for three months. It may take me a while, but I'm going to, you know, I'm just practicing. So if I fail, you can't fail at practicing, right? So but if you're trying to master, then it becomes a frustrating situation and people tend to give up. So I think that's my kind of number one in 
in working with anxiety is just keeping that mindset of practicing, not mastering. Yeah. That's such a pivotal point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now, um, so you work with people with jealousy and their difficulties around the area and their anxiety. And if people wanted to get in contact with you, Shannon, how would they do that? Yes. So um, as you mentioned, my podcast is called Jealousy Junkie. There's some amazing topics on there. Um, and if they wanted to reach me, I'm on Instagram at Jealousy Junkie Coach, or my website is just jealousyjunkie.com. Okay. And so do you work with people um, online? Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Yes. We've got... Um, I have coaching clients that I work with. And then right now I'm beta testing a new program called Dump the Junk. So I'm super excited. Mm. That'll be coming out soon, but that's in beta test right now. So, yeah. So what is that? What is that a course or something? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a six week course. Yep. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. And I'll be talking about that on the podcast as well. And when do you plan for that to be sort of released? to the world That'll, yeah so that program will co come out the beginning of february oh okay so people can keep checking on your on your website and then you'll have all the details there exactly yeah oh fabulous and so they work on it on their own at home yes yes and then there's a coaching session that they'll come to so we can talk through the exercises that they worked through on their own and and kind of help them if there's anything that they're they're stuck in or trying to to have a breakthrough on so yeah yeah amazing so that's yeah. very exciting isn't it it's super exciting I can't yeah. wait yeah oh well, Shannon thank you so much for sharing your time and all of this amazing knowledge um because you know it sounds like you've had a very difficult time throughout your life and now look at you you've learned so much and you're helping so many people which is yeah. incredible thank you so much it was a pleasure to be here I appreciate it yeah thank you Shannon so that's all for today's episode of Anxiety Hacks so thank you to everybody for listening and before before we go, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Apple iTunes or wherever you're listening so you never miss an episode. And of course, let us know what you think of the show and show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. So thank you to everybody for listening. And I look forward to chatting with you in the next episode.